Good evening. Um, I want to welcome everyone to uh, tonight's uh, roundtable on the future of the liberal world order. Uh, my name is Peter Trubowitz. I'm a professor of international relations and, uh, and the director of the Fallon United States Center um, uh, at LSE, which is hosting tonight's event. Um, tonight's roundtable is part of the um, Wanger uh, Distinguished Lecture Series uh, at LSE. The series aims to promote greater understanding of America's role in the world um, and is made possible by the generosity of um, the Henry and Consuelo Wanger Foundation. Um, so we meet at a time of um, when both hopes and I think doubts about the future of the liberal world order are running high. Um, Putin's invasion of Ukraine has sparked a considerable debate about whether the return of war to the European continent marks the close of the great expansion of uh, the liberal order that commenced in the 1990s uh, with the end of the Cold War or a renewal of, um, of liberal democracy's commitment um, to international uh, order building. Uh, for many, Putin's war heralds the return of great power rivalry, spheres of influence, nationalism. But for others, the speed, I think the breadth, the vigor um, of Western democracy's response to Putin's brutal war um, has, um, is viewed as a, a new beginning, marking uh, a new, new beginning. Um, a turning point for a liberal order that has been racked by division, um, self-doubt, uh, and backsliding. So has the post-Cold War era ended? Are we witnessing a renewal of democracy's commitment to the unfinished task of creating a world governed by the rule of law, human rights, and democratic principles? Well, these are big and difficult questions. They force us to ask ourselves where we are in historical time, and alas, what direction uh, we're traveling in. Fortunately, we have a Cracker Jack panel um, of experts to help us make sense of the moment um, and what it pretends. And in alphabetical order, uh, they are John uh, Eikenberry, um, the Albert Milbank Professor of Politics uh, and International Affairs at Princeton University in the Department of Politics in the School of um, public and international affairs. Uh, Mary Calder, Professor uh, Emeritus of Global Governance at LSE Ideas uh, and former director of the Conflict Research Program. Charles Kupchan, Professor of International Affairs in the School of Foreign Service and Government Department at Georgetown uh, University and a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. And Aisha Zarekal, Professor of International Relations at the University of Cambridge and Politics Fellow um, at Emanuel College. Uh, so welcome to all of you. It's great to have you here and to be doing this uh, in person. Um, we're gonna go in the following order tonight. Um, John is gonna get us started. Um, he'll be followed by uh, Aisha, then Charlie and Mary will round things out. So they're all sitting in the right, correct order there. Uh, we got plenty of time for audience questions. Probably when we go through there, um, I've asked each of them to open with um, uh, five minutes, uh, an opening comment at each. And perhaps once we go through, there might be a little bit of give and take. There might even be some different points of view. Um, and, and then what we'll do is we'll open this up to um, to Q&A from uh, the in-person audience um, and, um, and the online audience. We have a lot of people online as, as well. Um, for those of you who are here in person, probably many of you, it's the first event that you've come to in person in a long time. It's the first in-person event that the US Center has run since the pandemic struck. Um, and um, so there might be some hiccups along the way, but I think the main thing to do is to just, for those of you in the audience, if you have a question, you just have to remember how you used to. Like, <laughs> you just have to raise your hand. And so if you raise your hand, 
one of the ushers that will will try to get in as many people as possible one of the ushers will come to you it's a little confusing because i know that there are microphones this is like an lse iq test there are <laughs> microphones on these tables better way for the ushers because there aren't microphones on every table and i don't want you guys like scrambling for the microphone so wait for the usher to come around for those of you online we're going to get your questions in as well i have Chris Gilson here, the managing editor at the Cleveland Center, who will be fielding those questions, and we will put those questions to the um, to the panelists as as well. Um, so with that, um, we get to do this actually really the way we used to do it. Give our panelists a warm LSD welcome. Thank you, Peter. It's great to be here and to kick this off. I, I'm sorry to those in the audience that you can't just click and disappear uh, if, you, <laughs> if, you, if you don't like what we're saying. So you're stuck with us for, for an hour and a half. Well, I think uh, to get started, there is wide agreement that the post-war liberal order is in trouble. Uh, world order is at a crossroads, uh, a kind of world historical moment when you could imagine many different futures uh, uh, of order and disorder. Basic questions are back on the table. What are the sources of international order? Uh, scholars are reaching for their Morgenthau and their E.H. Carr and Polanyi to bring back the classic questions of order. Uh, other questions, will liberal democracies make a comeback? Uh, can democracy and capitalism reconcile themselves or come back into balance? And the question that I would pose uh, and really is, is, is our question tonight, what is the future of liberal internationalism? That is to say the organized and cooperative uh, arrangements uh, uh, for uh, for governance of the global system led by liberal democracies. I'll, I'll make three quick uh, points uh, because in some sense, the question that we want to uh, use to get into that larger set of problems is, uh, is the Ukraine war a, 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 sig a signal to the end of the liberal order or, or, or its renewal, as, as, as Peter said, um, can we imagine a future in which uh, uh, the great project of liberal internationalism, uh, uh, open societies operating in an open international order. Is that still possible? Is that now fanciful given the, the new uh, impingements of, of, this, uh, of, of this, this era? Uh, three points. First, the Ukraine war. I, I do think we uh, can see that war as a global order struggle uh, event. It's clearly more than just about the future of Ukraine. It's a struggle over the future of international order. At least two visions are, are in, in contest. One is the Western liberal model, open, multilateral, tied to a critical mass of liberal democracies, anchored in the EU, NATO, and the, e, and the G7, well-established systems. It's not just a hegemonic or, order, it's a kind of world system uh, with institutions and alliances and partnerships with a kind of game plan for generating uh, economic growth, security, protecting uh, uh, values. Uh, it's an order not based on geography, but on principles. Uh, if, you, uh, if you are a liberal democracy or, or aspire to be, you can join. Uh, think about Ukraine, think about Taiwan. Um, it's what Geer Lundstedt called an uh, empire by invitation. Uh, it, it, it accumulates partners. Uh, it's open uh, for partners. If you build it, they will come. Uh, the, the other uh, model on, on, on tap really is Russia and to some extent China, uh, a post-Western, a post-liberal order built around spheres of influence, echoes of the imperial past, a vision to make the world safe for autocracy. Putin clearly has this in mind, although he's at the early stage of, of really uh, uh, trying to uh, undermine, destroy, uh, sabotage, delegitimate the, the Western liberal order. But this other uh, vision of a post-Western order lurks, and so too with China in probably a slightly different way. Uh, Putin and Xi, uh, on the edges of the Olympics in February, issued their famous statement. In many ways, that was their response to Biden's uh, democracy summit, uh, arguing that, no, 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 we have a different vision of the future, and we are going to put it out there and, and work on it. 
Uh, so that's number one. Number two, the U Ukraine war has shown that the post-Cold War liberal order still has life in it. So I'm going to take that side of the, of the debate. Putin wanted to uh, deal it, uh, that order a fatal blow, but it has had the opposite effect. The EU has charisma again. Imagine that. Uh, NATO has a role. Germany has pivoted away from Russia. The US has a global uh, mission again. Um, uh, uh, people are in the streets shouting for freedom and dignity. There's a sense that the ideas of, of decent politics, of liberty, of freedom, uh, has an inspiring story back in the headlines. We've have, we haven't had that for, for, for a great deal of time. The Ukraine war has shown, and this is really the, the important point, the, uh, the power of coordinated action by the US and its allies and partners. We have seen a test proof uh, for the power of alliances and international cooperation. Yes, it may fade, uh, there, will, there will be blowback and we'll, we won't be as inspired as we were right at the beginning, but there is something here that shows us a possible future, not a global future, but a, a, a certainly a project for, for moving forward. And then thirdly, my last point, a large part of the world is on the fence. We have to acknowledge that. It's not a global struggle between two sides. There is, a, there is certainly a side that is, uh, or a group that is, is holding their, their powder, so to speak, keeping it dry. The US and the liberal state uh, 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 states, I think, as a result, have to work harder to make this contest over principles and norms that it's not the West geographically, the old Cold War free world against uh, these, uh, these other states that are seeking a room, room uh, under the sun for their own projects, but that is a, it's a contest over principles. And I don't think we're quite there elevating that as the struggle, that as the narrative. Uh, look at Putin. If you were to step back and say, what are the, the most fundamental principles of a modern, decent international order? I can, I can think of three principles. You might call them the Holy Trinity. One is you don't use nuclear weapons. You don't use force to annex territory of another state. And you don't kill or slaughter innocent uh, civilians. Putin has violated the second and third of those norms. And he has threatened to violate the first. Um, if there is to be a defense of those, those principles and norms and the broader agenda of an open uh, world where open societies can operate multilaterally, uh, it seems to me, and this is where what I would defend tonight, is the proposition that if that future is to have any life to it, it will have to be one defended by a grouping of liberal democracies as they try to keep the liberal international project alive. Thank you, John. That's great. Um, Aisha, let's turn to you. It's great to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. And um, uh, since I'm sitting in the middle between John <laughs> and Charlie, I'll use my five minutes to stake out also a middle position uh, <laughs> about the liberal in future of the liberal international order. Um, I'll start by talking about what gives me um, hope that it might survive in some of the ways that John identified, and then uh, talk a little bit about why we should be still a bit pessimistic, uh, and then maybe consider some short-term and long-term uh, possible scenarios. Um, so the reason for hope, as John has observed and others have said, you know, the, uh, the rallying effect that uh, Russia's war on Ukraine has created in Europe, in the West in general, uh, the kind of the backbone that's been shown. I don't think many of us were expecting that. Maybe John was, but you know, the rest of us. So all of that is you know, good, that there is political will to fight for this order. And maybe if the right choices are made, uh, something can be salvaged, the project can be reimagined, and there could be a like, long-term future for it. Um, but there are also reasons to be pessimistic. Uh, and the longer this war has gone on, the more pessimistic I've become, not because of uh, what Russia is doing, but I find that uh, commentators, but also to some extent, you know, actual decision makers uh, are um, going back and forth between uh, unwarranted optimism or what may be called uh, naivete <laughs> about uh, various problematic actors 
and then some kind of essentializing you know pessimism um and unless some kind of middle ground is found and i'll explain what i mean by that uh i think some wrong decisions will be made so assuming that for instance a problematic actor like erdogan or turkey let's say is going to just you know for whatever reason going to say okay <laughs> to uh, sweden and finland joining nato and not want anything in return that's i mean that's more than optimistic it's it's naive right i mean so why 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 is it a surprise like why 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 were all these assumptions made uh that um you know that kind of took that for granted as if the last you know uh 10 years two decades haven't happened uh at the same time you know assuming that some kind of deal can be cut um uh, and you know must immediately settle with somebody like Erdogan. But I mean, what I'm saying about Turkey, I mean, I'm from Turkey, but I think a lot of that dynamic also uh, translates to how people are reading, uh, you know, uh, Putin and Russia, you know, invasion wasn't successful in three days. Oh, that means it's never going to be successful. That's naive or optimistic. At the same time, arguing that, you know, Russia will always be a problem act actor you know, it will never be a democracy. That's like essentializingly pessimistic. Uh, and if the liberal international order is to survive, liberal uh, actors that are advocating for this order need to find, you know, a kind of a principled liberal internationalism that has a degree of, um, of course, you know, um, realpolitik in it because you can't exist in the world in any other way. But uh, you don't necessarily have to be so defeatist uh, and uh, in terms of dealing with uh, actors outside of the West, as if like there is no maneuvering room or they are doomed to be problematic actors. So some kind of middle ground has to be found. And I don't see uh, much of that uh, at the moment. And maybe, maybe it will happen. So uh, what is the, you know, that brings me to, you know, future scenarios. What is, you know, the best case uh, short term scenario? Uh, and that is actually something like the collapse of, you know, the, the, these problematic regimes, these problematic actors. Uh, we can talk about that more in the Q&A, but uh, again, you know, Putin is not going to be there forever. You know, there are actually very good commentators, you know, um, observing the, uh, the economic, you know, uh, difficulty that he's in. Uh, but, you know, for instance, you know, there recently Sergei Guriev, who's this, um, you know, expert uh, Russian economist, he, he was arguing for, you know, um, the um, embargo has to, has to be matched with price caps. Otherwise, you know, short term um, oil prices can go up and then, you know, put in actually that gives them some, some room to survive. But anyway, there, I mean, there are choices to be made that uh, we can actors like Putin, actors like Erdogan, uh, who are actually weaker than us assumed and could, in fact, uh, be gone in rapid succession in in this this year or next year. Right? That would be the best case scenario. But then the danger is what happened in the 1990s and a misplaced uh, euphoria or like some kind of again like end of history sort of thing where. You know, some of the grievances these countries have, have, you know, roots beyond particular leaders. So if that happens, you know, all, all history is contingent. If that happens, if that best case scenario happens, uh, mistakes of the past should not be repeated. Uh, and then there needs to be some kind of, you know, reckoning. Um, of course, that's an unlikely best case scenario. The more likely scenario is some kind of settlement, as people are arguing with these problematic actors. And there the problem is, you know, settling too quickly, too easily, uh, making concessions that don't need to be made, or, you know, emboldening, you know, Erdogan or somebody like him, just because you want to get rid of Putin, which just, you know, uh, postpones the problem or kicks the can down the line. And again, that's not necessarily a very good outlook for uh, the liberal international order. But I think maybe that is the more likely short term uh, uh, scenario. And then in the long term, I think uh, hopefully John is right. 
but the, 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 more, the more likely <laughs> say more <laughs> more likely the more likely outcome is um, you know some kind of regionalization uh, or fragmentation of the global order into various uh, island like units and in in that situation I mean I think you know best we can hope for is maintaining some kind some kind of tie that you know um, um, between these regions uh, and a degree of you know civility and um, connection and i don't look forward to that world but i think it's the most uh most likely one Aisha, thank you um charlie fragmentation regionalization good to have you back at the lsu good to be here peter nice to uh to see everybody in person um you know, if we had had this conversation six months ago, same title, Future of the Liberal World Order, same people, I'm guessing that a lot of our conversation would have been about us. Or I would say at least it should have been about us. Because what most surprises me about the trajectory of, of the liberal order is not that China hasn't signed on the dotted line or that Russia is a troublemaker and keeps grabbing territory from other countries. I, could, I think we would have predicted that 10, 15, 20 years ago. John wouldn't, because he's a little bit, you know, he drinks the Kool-Aid, but the rest of us, <laughs> the rest of us were wondering, why does John think China is gonna dock in our harbor? They're probably not, but I think I would have, agreed with John that the United States, the United Kingdom, other liberal democracies had built something remarkable, that it, they had changed the world, they had bent the arc of history toward more justice, more liberty. There you and I see eye to eye. But what most surprises me is that that order is weak. It's in trouble. I am much more afraid of Donald Trump than I am Vladimir Putin. <laughs> Is the future of freedom going to be determined in Donbass or Ohio? My answer to that is Ohio. And I fear or I'm concerned that the war in Ukraine by dominating our political debate, by having political and economic blowback effects that are just now beginning to kick in may actually make the liberal order weaker. It's not doing that now, it's actually strengthening it now. I would agree that the response has been remarkable, that the Biden administration, UK, the EU did a lot of homework and they have responded with remarkable strength, resolve. I'm all for sending more HIMARS and artillery and drones and javelins to Ukraine. But we have to look over the horizon and we have to make sure that we don't overreach. Uh, and let's just look at, at, at the, you know, the downside of this war going on and on, potential escalation. We're looking at a, a potential food crisis in the global south. Inflation is spiking. You know, I've got six people living in my house. My refrigerator empties every three days. I go trundling off to Trader Joe's, right? <laughs> Eggs, every time I go another 20 cents, I go to get some gas in my car and it like takes your breath away. Uh, this is not good news for liberal democracy and the restoration of the political center and to be kind of partisan in Craven, I think that the Democrats are gonna get creamed in November and that the America first Republicans are gonna make a comeback because they're not asking what's happening in Crematorsk. They're asking what's happening in Kansas and life in Kansas is not getting better, it's getting worse. And so, uh, you know, and I would make similar arguments about, about Europe. I think Europe has come together. Germany is spending hundred billion euros on defense pinch me. We never expected that to happen. 
but there are also 6 million refugees that have come in. Keep in mind that Poland a few months ago was shoving refugees back across in their border to die in the forests of Belarus. Immigration is an extraordinarily tough, volatile issue in Europe, including in this country. So let's just keep in mind that, yes, this is a war that has brought us together. It has brought a measure of bipartisanship back to the United States. Democrats and Republicans are together passing bills of $40 billion to send arms to Ukraine. But beneath the surface, we're still in trouble. Beneath the surface, a liberal populism is alive and well on both sides of the Atlantic. My guess is it's about to make a comeback in the United States. And as a consequence, we need to make sure that the conversation continues to focus on, on rebuilding the liberal order from within, right? If we think that Putin is gonna do it for us, we're kidding ourselves. Final uh, point, I think that, the, that the, the war, however it ends, is a defining, it's an inflection point. Uh, and barring Putin's fall from power and the emergence of a democratic regime in Russia, and I put the chances of that below 10%, we're headed back to a world of blocks. And on one side, there'll be the liberal democracies, and on the other side, there will be probably Russia and China, a kind of autocratic capitalist bloc. Uh, and it will be a little bit like the Cold War because there, be, there will be armed and militarized rivalry. And that will over time help strengthen the liberal order and strengthen coalition of liberal democracies. But it's also new in two respects and we're gonna have to figure out how to deal with these. One, we are much more globalized and interdependent than we were during the Cold War. There will be some deglobalization, but if we go back to a divided world and get behind our bunkers, we're never gonna tackle climate change or the cyber issues or global pandemics or global migration, we're gonna sink together. And two, the other side is going to be led by China. China, is going to be a full service, non-democratic great power. It has figured out how to build first class high tech industries. It will compete with the United States across the spectrum of economic and geopolitical realms. That will be new. The Soviet Union never got more than about 55% of US GDP. China will have the world's largest GDP by the end of this decade. We're gonna to have to figure out how to manage a world that is block-like, but does not lend itself to going back to a fragmented, segmented world. That says to me, we're headed towards something that looks very hybrid, very uh, multiplex in its nature. Mary. Not oh, that, sorry. Um, so I guess we're talking about the liberal world order as we imagined it in the 1990s as a multilateral system uh, with a spread of the international rule of law and uh, with an emphasis on human rights. So we never got it. And the question is, what went wrong? I want to mention two factors that I think went wrong before I get on to what might be happening now. One, I think, was that the United States never had its perestroika, like the Soviet Union did. Uh, the United States never dismantled the military industrial complex. We all hoped uh, that there would be a pan-European security system based on Helsinki, that both the Warsaw Pact and NATO would be dissolved but NATO stayed and indeed expanded, and NATO was fundamentally a war-fighting alliance uh, based on the Cold War and before that, the Second World War. I don't want in any way to suggest that that expansion 
explains Putin's behavior. I don't think it does, but it certainly provided a pretext. It was objectively a war fighting alliance. And also there were other, the militarization of American foreign policy continued with the invasion of Iraq and the continuing campaign, drone campaign, for example, the continuing war on terror. So I think that's one of the things that went wrong. But actually more importantly for me, is the second thing that went wrong. Somehow, every, most of the proponents of the liberal world order felt that free markets were a key element of the liberal world order, and particularly a sort of fundamentalist view of free markets. And I think what went wrong was four decades of market fundamentalism. And I think that's what's produced illiberal populism, not only in Russia, but also Trump phenomenon and the Brexit phenomenon here. Privatization and the contracting out of state functions produced this new class of oligarchs or crony capitalists or whatever you want to call them. Uh, Macroeconomic stabilization and liberalization produced inequality and unemployment. And people who we call in this country the left behind, I think you do in the US, the Rust Belt, who were very vulnerable to these ethnic, racist or religious ideologies which framed the crony capitalism. So for me, that's much more serious actually than the first, but both are very important factors. So the question really is, are we at a moment of change? And I think we are at a moment of change, but a very fragile moment of change. First of all, I think COVID-19 has marked a break with market fundamentalism. I disagree on one thing with Charles, which is I have a, I'm more optimistic about the future of the European Union. And part of it is for a rather sort of economistic reason that they've invented euro bonds and this recovery fund is only the beginning of hugely increased spending within the European Union. Biden, of course, was proposing the same thing, and it would have been wonderful if it had got through Congress. <laughs> but all the things that have just been said makes it look unlikely. But so I think there is a shift here on neoliberalism, which is really significant, and we hope it can go further. I think also Ukraine has produced a shift in the other aspect. I've been spending quite a lot of time with NATO people recently, and there is a feeling that the way in which NATO was organized for a war involving millions of civilian casualties, Ukraine has just shown how absurd all that was, and that there really is a need to shift posture to something more defensive, more aimed at protection of civilians. And I think we'll see that in the new strategic concept. And I think it also reflects a shift of power between the US and Europe, because this has been very much sort of thinking among European states. So when Germany announces a big increase in military spending, I don't think it's gonna be on the old NATO model. It's gonna be very different. So those are two hopeful things, but then there are all the terribly negative thing. And the most negative thing is the war. I mean, I can't see, I, I can't see any, there are two alternatives. Either it escalates and we're in World War Three. We really are in annihilation territory. Putin seems willing to use nuclear weapons or he doesn't. And it's a long stalemate in the Donbass. And my fear is as somebody who studies wars in a lot of places, that this will lead to social fragmentation, that the wonderful civic spirit we've seen in Ukraine, it's very difficult to sustain over a long period. And we'll see more fragmentation inside Russia as well. There might be a diplomatic solution, thanks to Erdogan perhaps, <laughs> But I think, it, I think a diplomatic solution will just freeze the situation as it did in the Donbass. It will be better than a continual slog with thousands of young men dying, but it will still mean a disintegrative situation. 
Is there any alternative? Can we be hopeful given the other factors I've mentioned? I do think change inside Russia is the only way um, that this war could really seriously end. And is there a prospect? There is an anti-war movement. There is a, a very powerful set of you know, reluctant soldiers, conscientious objectors and so on. And I think you know, what it draws attention to is that maybe in the past, the liberal world order was too top down. It's really important to find ways to create space for these civil society pressures, because in the end, they're the only way that we're going to defeat these illiberal tendencies, which are at the root of the problem. Wow, that's a terrific set of um, opening comments. And um, I want to turn it over to the audience, but I think before I do, I mean, have, are you still drinking the Kool-Aid? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wanted to give each of you a kind of opportunity to, um, to respond. And I, 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 but I also am curious, I mean, there were references to, to China, but if, and I would like to just hear a little bit more uh, about this. I mean, if the war does, if we go with Mary's last scenario, that it turns into an unbelievable slog, you know, um, and um, that um, you're arguing that it would lead to some fragmentation inside uh, Russia itself. So there's the kind of internal dynamics, but I wonder where does China, the longer this thing goes on, the more that they kind of hold firm, hold steady with, with, with Russia, or do they view it as a kind of, um, almost like a declining asset to be attached to? Can, can I answer a different question? You can. <laughs> I, I, I think for me, I, and I wanna talk about that, but I do think the, the most basic question, and indeed, I think we might all agree that the most worrisome, feature of the crisis of liberal order is the, is the liberal democracies themselves, and not least the United States and its peers in, in Europe. And I, I think that's, a, that's the question we should be uh, uh, pondering. Uh, are liberal societies viable in the 21st century? It's, it's a 250 year experience coming out of the age of democratic revolutions. These uh, really quite fragile republics, rule of law, separation of church and state, constitutionalism, free press, uh, a, a, and a kind of nascent vision of, of an open society that would be not based on ethnic uh, or racial uh, 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 divisions, but be multicultural in some sense. And here we are 250 years later, and, and are we at the end of the road or looking back, will we see a repetition of what happened before, which is a kind of reinvention, a kind of resiliency. It, uh, think about uh, the, the generation of 1945. Read Ira Katz Nelson's book, uh, Desolation and Enlightenment. The, our, our earlier liberals uh, who in 1945 looked at the Great Depression, the rise of totalitarianism, the rise of fascism, of, of total war, uh, of the Holocaust, of the atomic bomb, all in their narrow professional lifetime, and yet they picked up the pieces and reinvented liberal society. Uh, and and, and liberal society was changed. And this is where I, I guess I would, uh, so I agree with Charlie that uh, everything is lost if, if these uh, fragile, vulnerable, uh, uh, open societies can't rebuild the social contract and, and rebalance the, the inherent uh, tensions that exist inside of liberal democracies. That's why they're so dynamic. Uh, their strength is also their weakness. They're built on tensions, liberty and equality, individualism and community. So there is a kind of unstable core and can it be managed and reinvented? And I, I, I guess looking back at the generation 1945, they did it and they, they did it partly because the outside world was providing uh, uh, an elevation of the stakes. And that's what we see today. China and Russia are very much uh, uh, making the project of reinvention all that more important. Uh, so I don't have an answer to, to Charlie's concern. I think it is the right question, but uh, I, 
I think we have to be part. We have to be part of that project of reinvention to 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 make the case. Whether we're public intellectuals, scholars, uh, try to illuminate the pathway, however narrow it might be, into the next uh, liberal age. And uh, again, I, I I'm as worried as everybody, but I think that's where the work has to be. But if you go back to Mary's point, it, it wasn't only the external challenge after World War II. It was that capitalism was much more managed than what, we, what was on offer in the 1990s and, and since. And so that there was much more social protection. There was a, that the, the contract that you're referring to involved managing kind of um, capitalism itself. So it seems to me it would need, you'd need both. You can't, and I think you agree with that, but. Read Polanyi. Yeah. I know I agree that that's yeah. where, that's, that, that is the, 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 that is the issue of can we rebuild an embedded yeah. liberal society? Ch Charlie, what about, I mean, you were, have argued for some time that there was, um, that um, the U.S. really needed to find a way to align with Russia and kind of pull it away from, from China. And I think you've also argued that right now that's off the table. Um, but what are, what are the possibilities for that fragmenting, in a sense, almost independently of what the U.S. does, other than like continuing to support the Ukrainians? possibility of, of fragmentation inside Russia? Like no, 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 separation between Russia and China. No. Um, I think it's unlikely. You know, I think that the Chinese are quietly uncomfortable with this war because they bank on geopolitical stability and globalization, and this war provides neither. Mm -hmm. But it also pushes Russia into the arms of China Weaker. Uh, and it, uh, it it distracts us. You know, we're now sending our aircraft, our F-35s and our warships and our javelins to Ukraine and to the, the Eastern Front of NATO, not to the Asia Pacific. Right. They like that. They were happy as clams when we were spinning our wheels in Afghanistan and Iraq, right? Then they were like, oh, uh oh, here comes the pivot. But then Putin invades Ukraine. Oh, that's nice. It's a nice distraction. But just a, a, a quick comment on this last issue. I, you know, I, I, I agree with, with you, Mary, that a lot of it was bad policy uh, and that neoliberal orthodoxy, let the market prevail, led to the hollowing out of our, of our working classes and our middle classes. And we need to, to figure out how to correct that. Otherwise, we're going to be you know, in the soup for a long time. But I also think we're passing through one of those historical inflection points, right? The digital age is upon us. We don't yet know how to, how to you know, even if we knew that, that we needed new policy, we're not sure what the policy would be. What are, what are average Brits and Americans going to do 15 years from now? to earn a living wage? I don't know the answer to that question because the guys that used to work in the factories are now in the service industries, but automation is gonna to come to the service industries. So you know, we need to figure out what these people are gonna do just like we did when the industrial era started. We figured it out. And I'm uh, optimistic that we will and that this experiment, 250 year experiment will, will prosper, but it's going to take a lot of hard work. And it, what, what most tr troubles me is our political systems, right? The United States and the United Kingdom are in a race to the bottom, right? You wake up every morning. It's like, which country is more screwed up? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure what the answer to that is because they're really in a tough competition. Uh, one final uh, issue, because I'm sure it's, it's part of our agenda tonight. You know, as I said, I'm all for supporting the Ukrainians, but I do think it's time for us to pivot. Right now, we kind of give arms without strings attached. Go to it. I think it's time to start engaging in a, in a, in a dialogue with Kyiv, with our allies about an endgame. 
And that will require a change in the political narrative. It will require confronting the reality that this war may end with a chunk taken out of Ukraine. But I'm not sure that that's avoidable. I don't think Ukraine has the combat power to expel Russia from Crimea and Donbass, nor do I think it's strategically wise. That's a conversation that we should be having. We're not having it. And I think that's very dangerous. Mary. Yeah, I, oh gosh, I, there's several things I want to come in on. I think it's easy to see what people would be doing in this new digital age. They would be cleaning up the world. They would be making renewable energy. They would be doing, all, there's a whole raft of things for them to do. That's not a problem. The question is, how do we get there? And as you and John both rightfully said, the history of capitalism, we've gone through these phases several times before. It wasn't just the second, First and Second World War, the Napoleonic Wars, the wars. But in the past, war itself, the struggle to win wars, has brought about dramatic change. And the problem that we have is that if we were going to go through that process now, it would mean annihilation. So we have to find another way of making the change. In the past, the big changes that came were the things that social movements in the previous era had been pushing for, whether it was civil rights and so on in the Napoleonic Wars, whether it was uh, political rights and emancipation in the mid-century wars, whether it was economic and social rights in the Second World War. You know, now it's going to be issues of the green movement and other things. But what it means is we have to take those movements seriously without being forced to take them seriously, which is why uh, it's terribly important uh, to think about the role of citizens. The other aspect of all this is that each time the nature of the state and the nature of the world order has changed. And I think part of the problem, we, I talked about neoliberalism, but I think the other part of the problem, I used to think when I was studying Yugoslavia and Syria, that it was the heritage of authoritarian states combined with neoliberalism. I now think it's just what I sometimes call the sclerosis of the nation state, that we've got too rigid, that our representative systems don't work. Mm. So I think we've got to be able to think quite radically about new forms of multilateralism that are really global governance, if you like, and, and new forms of decentralization. Mm -hmm. We've got to think of changes in governance and not just changes in the economy. Um, on the, I just wanted to say a couple of other things. One on the diplomatic solution. Um, I think the key thing, I mean, of course, a diplomatic solution will be better than not having one, and it will mean giving up a chunk of territory. But the key issue is not whether, for instance, Crimea should be Russian or Ukrainian. It's whether it's allowed to be democratic. I mean, when Russia annexed Crimea, it removed a pro-Maidan government that was allied with the Crimean Tatars and put in place a Russian criminal mafia who discriminated against the Tatars, who stole property. And so I think what the West has, if, if we have any role in this, which we may not, is to do what we did in Helsinki and absolutely insist on human rights guarantees and some kind of, I don't know, international presence or something. That seems to me, because I think if we get the kind, that kind of a typical diplomatic solution, we will have these criminal mafias in the, Russian occupied areas and they will contribute to fragmentation. So you don't get to respond either do you. Um, before we go to the audience, Lisha, is there anything? That... Well, I'm and... happy to go to the audience. Okay, so <laughs> we're gonna go, we'll go to the audience at this point. So um, just please raise your hands. Um, you know, if you wanna put a question um, and I will get the um, usher in. The first question will go down here. The woman in a black top, right? And um, and then we'll we have a second usher. Where's the second usher? That gentleman right there in the green. Okay. So please, um, your name and your 
um, not your serial number, your affiliation, um, your name and your affiliation. Oh. Like if you're in a program, which program at LSE? Uh, hi, uh, my name is Arimbi. Um, I'm a master of comparative politics here at the LSE. Um, so I wanted to ask if, first of all, if a liberal world order is necessarily synonymous with a US led order, and particularly if so, what does this order offer to countries, especially those in the global south that feel that the US is hostile to their interests, especially with regards to military aggression and market fundamentalism? I mean, this was especially the case even in the so-called golden age of welfare capitalism and embedded liberalism. So again, what can it really offer to a lot of these countries now? Okay, that's great. Um, over here, yes, go ahead. Um, yes. Wait one second. Ah, I'm sorry, we'll have to wait till the next time. Go ahead. Uh, hi, my name's Cameron. Uh, I'm doing a master's in international relations. Um, thank you all for the comments, they're all very insightful. Uh, just a question for Professor Charles Kopchan. You painted quite a pessimistic, pessimistic picture of uh, the state of affairs following like the Ukraine war. Um, I was just wondering if that kind of state of affairs, you know, we're talking about inflation and whatnot, is that inevitable or can there be policies to mitigate against that? I mean, you mentioned rebuilding liberal international order from within. I was kind of wondering what that would look like and if it's possible. And we're gonna take a question from the online audience, Chris. Thank you. Um, before I go to the question, I just want to say that people are on the platform from the UK, the US, Germany, and India. Uh, the first question comes from Sue Dexter, who's an LSE alumna from 1987, who's based in Los Angeles. Uh, they ask, is the process of isolating nations in the short or long term an effective policy to furthering global cooperation? And how can we address disinformation that threatens the liberal order? Okay, great. So we've got three questions here. Um, does anybody want to take, um, you can choose and pick and choose. John? Yes, I'll take the, the first question. Um, Door number one. Uh, is liberal international order so entangled in American hegemony that uh, for better or worse, or is, is there something beyond American power that might still allow for liberal order to, to exist and flourish? Um, I, I, my, I have three responses. Number one, liberal international order as a set of ideas are are not attached in, in kind of theory and and uh, uh, principle to any state They're, they are uh, in that sense universal and uh, standing on their own as ideas uh, uh, but they are uh, and this is what I wrote about in my most recent book they are are not ideas that that in and of themselves provide the the basis for global political movements for what they want, liberal order, open rule-based and so forth. It's, it's, they're, they're, it's a flag without an army. Liberal international order as an agenda, as a project has always needed to affiliate with other social, with other forces of modernity, if you will. Uh, uh, empire in the 19th century, great power uh, projects, uh, capitalism uh, and Anglo-American hegemony for sure. Uh, so uh, it always it sort of needs to rest uh, on, uh, on, a, on, on a, a host, so to speak, that can build coalitions that are broader than the liberal agenda. So in that sense, I do think it requires bigger coalitions. Uh, that's what I think history tells us. Secondly, um, yes, liberal order has um, been disappointing to, to many peoples and societies uh, and interestingly, because it's not liberal international enough, uh, it, it doesn't fulfill its promise. And that's kind of an interesting aspect of liberalism more generally, that it's always a kind of promissory note, a work in progress, an imperfect union, uh, passing to the next generation uh, um, a project that, that isn't finished and needs to be moved forward. Think about Obama's uh, remarks in his eulogy for John, for John Lewis, the representative. Um, uh, so it provides principles that embarrass you if you don't live up to them, hypocrisy, and it provides institutions to, to provide movements of voice. Um, and so that's my second point, that, uh, that there's more there, uh, and, and even ideas that are liberationist in nature for oppressed people outside of the West. And there's a story there that has not been fully told. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, uh, the alternatives 
look very bad for small, vulnerable, non-Western developing states in a world where there's less liberal international order. It's not going to be a moment of, of great opportunity. It's going to be spheres, blocks, coercive hierarchy, um, uh, uh, international state-to-state -state deals that lock in autocracy and oligarchy and corruption and uh, illiberalism. So I, you do kind of have to, in the end of the day, pick sides. And I think it's pretty obvious which side uh, weak and vulnerable societies would want to ally with. Charlie, one question was addressed directly to you. Uh, yeah, I'm the, I'll touch on two issues. One is the, I think that, that liberal order, that any order is very difficult to disentangle from power and interests. And I think this is a place where John and I differ. That you know the, the the what we call the liberal international system was made possible first by the power of the British and the public goods provided by Britain and then Pax Americana and it reflected American and British interests uh, and the the two are very difficult to to untangle and when there is a shift in the global distribution of power. Ideas that may not have had as much cachet before have cachet because they become attached to power. And so when two thirds of the world, which, and that's the world we now live in, trades more with China than with the United States, that's going to make it harder for the United States to push out the liberal order. Because if the Chinese are the folks that are showing up in Mali or wherever, and they have the bags of cash, and they're saying, we build a bridge and we're gonna build a port and we're gonna do this, that, and the other thing, hey, you're gonna say, you're gonna say yes, which doesn't mean that I don't share John's view that we as humans are instinctively driven toward dignity and wanna be and live in free societies and wanna vote, but our ideas aren't as appealing as they used to be when the other guy is showing up with the cash. Ideas matter, material interests matter, probably more. Final uh, issue on, on Ukraine. You know, I don't, uh, I wish that, that I could say with confidence that we can and should defeat Russia and push them out of Ukraine. Uh, that's the right thing to do. It's the legal thing to do. It's the moral thing to do. It's just not going to happen. Uh, and so I think we need to, to confront that reality. And we need to be very careful yeah. about overdoing it. Right? The mistakes that the United States has made over the last 20 plus years have really been about overreach. Right? We've tried to turn Afghanistan and Iraq into Ohio, and it was a disaster. And then we went into Syria, and we went into Libya, and we broke it. And then we expanded NATO right up into Russia's you-know-what. Right? It was not the right thing to do. Yeah, I agree with Mary. It's, is it, does it explain the invasion of Ukraine? No. Did it give Putin cause for grievance? Yes. Should we have pursued Ukrainian membership in NATO? No, right? And now we seem to be making the same kind of mistake. We're saying, this is, not, this is 1938, this is 1939. If we don't stop Putin in Donbass, it's curtains, the sky's gonna fall. That's not true. If Putin keeps hold of Donbass and Crimea for the next 100 years, we're going to be fine. So let's just call it like we see it. Disinformation? Yeah. It's not, it's not on disinformation, but. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I want to say um, something about each question. I mean, first, what does the liberal international order offer the global south? Um, I mean, it's easy to argue not much, right? I mean, uh, you know, I've, writ I've written quite a bit about various grievances of others against the liberal international order. 
Uh, and that's part of the reason why, you know, this war on Ukraine is not generating the kind of sympathy, you know, outside of Europe uh, and the US that it does, you know, because as far as the rest of the world is concerned, this is like not that different from what the US has been doing. So why, why is there so much more outrage when Russia does it, right? I think there is a general sentiment. Uh, and that's part of why even China is very unhappy with Putin. They're never going to officially say like, this is terrible behavior because as far as they're concerned, this is great power behavior. You know, it's, it's not uh, weird or problematic when uh, others do it. Um, at the same time, again, you know, because I have ties to Turkey, I can say like in the 1990s, when there was this idea of liberal international order and something to join, I think John is right about that. that it was easier to be a, like a democracy or a human rights activist, because then if you were put in prison, at least somebody would pretend to kind of care. And then there would be like <laughs> committees or whatever, like they would come and inspect like prison conditions, right? Like, so uh, it did, in removing that actually makes, makes the world a tougher and harsher place for people who care about these values. So maybe, you know, at the country level, not so much, but if you do, if you <laughs> are with John, uh, but you're living not in the US, but elsewhere, but maybe soon in the US, I don't know. Um, yeah, so then it, it matters that there is something and powerful actors care about this order and then they want to pressure or they every now and then they use their, you know, force for good. Uh, on the question of, um, is it good to, you know, isolate countries? I mean, to the extent that this question is about Russia. Um, I mean, first, in, in political science, there's quite a bit of literature showing that, you know, sanctions don't quite work, and uh, especially when they're open-ended uh, and they, they're done out of, like, you know, punishment, vengeance, etc. I mean, going to some of the points that Charlie raised, uh, at the same time, there are people who think that in this case, it, it might work on Russia if they're done just right. But I'm not at all convinced that Russia is in fact isolated, um, truly. I mean, it seems that way from here. And certainly some people there don't ha are not happy with what's happening, but I was just in Istanbul and there are, uh, you know, lots of, <laughs> lots of Russians in, in Turkey now. Um, you know, my mother owns a public relations firm. She was visited by, you know, Russians who said the Westerners are out. We now want, you know, Turks to come in. And I'm sure that's only like one piece of the story, right? So it's, it's on the one hand, you know, it's this, I'm, I mean, there, we can debate whether sanctions can be affected, but as they are, I think they're just giving Putin, you know, social standing, oh, the West is against me, you know, and then economically, they're not really hurting that much because there's so many loopholes and alternate routes, et cetera. So um, again, I've agreed with both of you. If that's, <laughs> that's, my, that's my thoughts. Do you want to say anything or I'll go to another round of questions? Or... I, I'm happy to wait if you want. I have got a few things to say, but well, I can- Go ahead and take <laughs> things in the room. Um, well, actually it's partly because Asia raise the issue of sanctions, because mm. I do think that's a very important issue at the moment. Because while I strongly, of course, it was the right thing to do to impose dramatic sanctions at the beginning. I don't think there was enough thought about how those sanctions were going to affect Russia and what were the right sanctions. And I think there's a real problem with the sanctions. Uh, and the problem is, that it's precisely the sort of nice middle-class people who are gonna be hit by this, who are most likely to join an anti-war movement, mm. who are gonna leave. They're gonna be hit by it and they're gonna leave. And the poor people who are gonna be hit by it are the ones who will stay, are the ones most vulnerable to state propaganda. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, uh, what was that? They're the, and they're going to assume that it's the West's responsibility. Mm. So I think I'm really worried. I mean, if we think about Venezuela, we think about Syria, uh, we think about Iraq, 
I mean, the only case which anyone can point to where sanctions have been effective was South Africa, where it was strongly supported <coughs> by the African National Congress. In these other cases, it really has led to fragmentation and criminalization. And the problem is that the oligarchs, even if you have targeted sanctions, the oligarchs are just brilliant at finding ways to evade the sanctions. And it actually enhances their criminality. So these are all huge problems, and I think that it's related to the diplomatic issue, because I think we need to be thinking about how to redesign the sanctions so that they make possible, they actually make possible support to civic elements. That will mean lifting some of the sanctions, but couldn't one link lifting some of the sanctions to ceasefires, mm. to diplomatic? So I think that's a possible way forward. The other thing to say, is that I think there should have been oil and gas sanctions, that it's just ridiculous that we haven't stopped the oil and gas. And we should have done that years ago. And I've been for a long time advocating, uh, we need to get reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, not just for climate change, but to end rich dictators. Mm -hmm. Most of the horrible dictators in the world are dependent on oil revenues. And finally, on this sanctions thing, I think we just do need to expand our capacity for legal routes at dealing with oligarchs and crony capitalists. That's a much more effective way than targeted sanctions. So I wanted to say that, but I also wanted to make another point related to this issue of why do we make such a fuss about um, Ukraine when we didn't do the same on Iraq and what's the difference? I, I agree with that, that there is no difference. But my feeling is once we've made it clear that we think aggression is terrible, we've made it clear that we think killing civilians is terrible, it has an effect on our own behavior. And I feel that's also true in relation to refugees. It's horrible that we welcome all these Ukrainians and we won't allow the Afghans and the Syrians and all of this. But I actually have a different view than Charlie on immigration. I think immigration is going to be really, really good for the European economy. I think we need more people. I think the whole immigration thing was, it wasn't that there was so much immigration that people became concerned. It was rather that right-wing politicians decided to seize on immigration. And then it became a concern and we stopped. And actually, it's a big problem for European societies that we don't have enough immigration. So my hope is that all of this will actually chain, make us rethink these other things, make us rethink refugees from other places, make us rethink Iraq, our behavior in, in other countries, make us... And it is already, I mean, there's a huge emphasis now on... A most fascinating aspect of Ukraine is the emphasis on international law. Everybody is documenting war crimes. The whole of Ukrainian civil society, the ICC is there, the UN is there. It's suddenly making us really take issues of universal jurisdiction, of international law much more seriously. So um, that's, that's just a point. I mean, then all the negative things are there true. <laughs> Okay, we're going to take some more questions. Um, let's take um, the woman in the white shirt. Yeah, right there. Um, a tan sweater, I think. Yeah. And then I'm going to come down with the guy in the green shirt right here. One sec, though. Go ahead. All right. Oh. Um, hi, I'm Lizzie Weingart. I'm a master's in the international relations program. And so I want, my question is for the panel, but um, Charles Kupchan, for you particularly, you mentioned pre previously about Xi Jinping and his sort of quiet discomfort with the war in Ukraine, but also how it does benefit China in the distraction that it has, it has created. So I'm wondering if you could elaborate more on where you see China's role being in the next three to six months of this conflict, if it continues, and what the US, the UK, the EU could do to sort of make Xi Jinping pick a side? Because obviously he's walking a tightrope. 
Lizzie, apologies too. I didn't recognize you without a mask. So <laughs> down here. My name is Ganesh. I'm from India. Uh, would you agree that the single biggest challenge which we face at present to the future of the liberal world order is the food crisis which is looming large on the horizon? If about a third of the world goes hungry, do you think there is any real possibility of maintaining this liberal world order as we see it? And I have a simple suggestion to offer, which I don't know, maybe it's a naive suggestion, it may or may not work. The food deficit countries are not aligned either with the USA or with the EU. They are mostly countries in Africa and Asia. Is it not possible for them to form an organization and to make a direct appeal to Russia to allow these huge stocks of grain running into hundreds of thousands of tons, which are rotting in Ukraine and also in, in, in Russia, to be released directly to those countries? So that Russia doesn't have to, can't possibly lay down a condition that sanctions have to be eased because it is not striking a deal either with US or with EU. Press a question from the online. Thank you. I just want to say people are on the platform from Canada, Greece, and Costa Rica as well. So this question comes from Johnson Chandam, a doctoral student at the University of Warsaw and currently based in India, who asks, do you think Russia or China are destroying the entire foundations of liberal international order, given the fact that many aspects of the order are being supported by them? It gives the example of the United Nations. Trade liberalization or so forth. Floor is open. I think Charlie has Charlie? the first question. Uh, I'm uh, the Xi Jinping, and what, what's he going to do? Uh, I think that he will more or less stand by Russia, unless the Russians do something really wacky, like use a nuclear weapon. And then I, I have no idea what the Chinese would do. Uh, and I think that they will continue to skirt secondary sanctions. To the best of my knowledge, they are not actively engaged in activities, overt activities that would invoke secondary sanctions. Uh, and so they're, they're being quite careful about this. I don't know what's going on behind closed doors. I'm guessing that the Chinese are helping the Russians in ways that we don't know economically, maybe providing technology that's been banned by the, the West. But uh, I think they'll be very careful about, about how they do that. Two other relevant comments. One is to reinforce the point that John made initially. It is quite striking the degree to which most of the world is sitting this out. It's a real window into what this next order is going to look like, because only 41, 42 countries are adhering to the sanctions regime. That means most of the world is, don't, don't, don't look at us, right? They don't want to choose sides. They're not going to kind of go with the liberal democratic camp. They're not going to go with the Russia-China bloc. Uh, and so I think we're going to be in a, in a very complicated world where we just don't know where countries are going to go. There won't be the same predictability that we're, that we're used to. Maybe Isa can comment as because she works on it. Finally, I think a really interesting issue to keep an eye on over the next six to 12 months is, is deglobalization. Um, because you know, right now, the Chinese are watching what's happening to Russia. And all of a sudden, this globalization that made everybody giddy for the last 30 years has a dark side to it. Uh, and I would guess that what we're going to see is more mutual deglobalization in, in high tech, in military technologies, in pharmaceuticals. Uh, and, and this, this is going to be, I don't, I'm not someone who thinks it's going to go like all the way. We're just going to cut ties with China. But uh, this is a very, a very interesting issue to keep an eye on as this war plays out. And the food security question. I wanted to say something about China and Russia and uh, whether there is uh, some more complex uh, relationship that they have with liberal order. And I think the answer is yes. Uh, uh, you could say that China and Russia 
at different phases since the end of the Cold War have been picking and choosing where they want to uh, opportunistically connect to that order, whether it's in trade and finance and, and other areas. Uh, I, I've made the argument that that's, that's actually what led to the, the weakening of this order, that it lost its club-like character, that uh, in the earlier era, uh, um, there was a sense that if you buy into this order, you are buying into a, a kind of a full service relationship, uh, a mutual aid society where you get security, you get access to trade, you get access to IOs that help you manage interdependence. And in return, you buy into a suite of responsibilities and uh, obligations. That ends with the end of the Cold War. Russia and China selectively intervene. It's not a club. It's more like a shopping mall where you can go in and go to one place or the other. And it loses its co coherence, its social purpose. And of course, neoliberalism was working along the way at the same time. I, I just one point about that selectivity, uh, it is, that some of that selectivity is simply um, agreements that can be made across ideological divides to manage problems of modernity. Uh, even during the, the Cold War, uh, the period from the mid 60s to the mid 70s, it's a very interesting period to, to look at US-Soviet relations and, and see these uh, amidst the Cold War and the struggle and the arms racing, there was still uh, um, uh, pr pragmatic problem solving, the WHO and smallpox and lots of other areas. And of course, then you did get to a pretty impressive uh, arms control agenda. So I expect that would happen probably in post uh, Putin Russia, but even China before that, um, uh, I think Biden, who's a China hawk and his team, nonetheless, in, uh, in uh, Blinken's most recent speech is clearly keeping space for an agenda of engagement and and what we might call Westphalian internationalism. It's not internationalism to support liberal values or to uh, human rights or trade policy that helps unions and so forth. That's a, an agenda for the liberal grouping uh, who have elevated social purposes and have a reason why they wanna to work together and other people might not be in on it. But there is a, there are wider realms of cooperation that are internationalist, that are not tied to regime type, but to are you willing to make agreements and abide by them? Uh, that's the, those are the terms of entry for a Westphalian international uh, realm. And there's a lot of work to be done there, as I think several people on the panel have said, uh, on uh, climate change, on pandemics, arms control, proliferation issues, uh, refugees. So there's I think there's still an upside for that. And um, uh, we may be heading to, towards a world of blocks, but I don't think it's uh, inconsistent with, with some other wider realm that, uh, that uh, cooler heads will see as an important uh, uh, area we have to work together on. I can make a quick response to Ganesh on food security if yeah. you want. It's a very important question. and. Uh, I think it comes back to the issue you raised about the global South because they're going to watch this, right? And they're going to say the elephants are fighting and we're starving. Uh, and we're getting very close to that. Uh, and the, you know, it, it, this to strikes me as a place where the diplomacy could start because it's, it's a mutual problem. The, the Russians are blockading the ports. The Ukrainians have mined the ports. So they're both, both sides have some responsibility here. And, you know, people have looked into getting it out through other, you can, you know, stick it on a train and go to, through Belarus, but Belarus under sanctions. So that would mean you'd have to go out into Poland and up to Lithuania, but you have to change the gauge of the tracks twice. So it ain't happening. Uh, so really the, the, I think a great place to start is open, Ukraine's ports to the Black Sea. The stockpiles are full. The second harvest is about to come in. This is a great place where the Russians and the Ukrainians could say, for the sake of you know, feeding people, this is a start on diplomacy. Just don't give Erdogan credit for this. <laughs> I would give Erdogan credit for it. Let him have it. Let's get a few more questions in. Let's go to the gentleman in the back there. Um... Yeah. No, this one over here. Yep. 
right up there. And then we'll take a woman right there with her hand next to you. Hi, thank you. Um, I really appreciate everything that's been said so far. I wanted to ask a question to the panel about how to imagine uh, helping domestic audiences regain their enthusiasm for the liberal projects and their at the state level um, as kind of fundamental components to supporting the liberal international order at the macro level. Um, I think something that uh, can be a big stumbling block um, and really hampering to progressive efforts to help domestic audiences re-engage the liberal ideas, the fact that unfortunately even progressive political spaces are so captured by elitism. You know, Even as a student of history here at LSE, everyone would describe themselves as a, as a progressive, but most of my classmates were in fact quite wealthy. And when you think about the institutions who feed into the policy-making class uh, and to the policy shaping class, I think this can be a huge effort is, uh, issue, especially when we're trying to imagine how can we best support like the average British and American worker. Um, and you know, even once again with this panel is mostly composed of folks who are maybe white or could pass as white and wealthy. And I think it's hard to then sell the case for the liberal projects need to do their best to you know, embrace multiculturalism when we in fact still have these issues with hypocrisy. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Nikki Mikkelsar. Um, I'm an international relations undergraduate student here at the LSE. And my question is, um, isn't there a risk that a diplomatic solution in Ukraine, so giving Putin some territorial concessions, would severely weaken the liberal world order by setting the wrong precedent? So I'm very curious about your opinions on whether it might send the wrong signal to Putin in Russia or Xi in China, enabling them to ask for further concessions, for example, in Eastern Europe or Taiwan. Thank you so much. Okay, two great questions. One last question from the online audience. So Edmund Adam of McMaster University in Canada has a question for all the speakers. What role do you envision for universities and higher education institutions more broadly in propping up the liberal project, given the fact that the project is predicated on ideas, which is quintessentially the business of universities, and that universities have access to students who will ultimately operate the institutions of liberal democracy? So let's let's hold that last question about what, what can universities do? What should universities, what's our role? So, and start with the two questions that were um, posed at the top. Uh -huh. One about, about appeasing, appeasement, and domestic. and domestic, on the domestic side. I'll say something about domestic. Okay, go okay. ahead. Well, I, I do think that's an important insight. And, and looking across uh, 100 years of liberal internationalism, uh, it's always been a, a, a complex interplay between international and domestic agendas and movements and uh, programs um, in each uh, era an international struggle ensued, World War I, World War II, the Cold War. And there were international coalitions of liberal democracies that elevated the struggle and put it in, a, in, in, a, a, in terms of, of making the world safe for, for values. You, you had the allies in World War I, the United Nations in World War II, and the free world in, in the Cold War, three iterations of this. And in each case, there was a, an underpinning of domestic uh, innovation. So World War One, it was the Progressive Era. World War Two, the the New Deal, and and then World, then post World War uh, Two, the Cold War. There was yet another vital center kind of uh, each uh, reimagining liberal democracy, connecting it to values that are in, in play internationally. Uh, 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 efforts to 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 do what to do at home. Uh, things that will make you more credible in your struggles abroad. So it, it, the kind of confluence of forces that, that add, add to the efficacy of the, of the effort. Um, so I think the kind of uh, the Main Street, uh, um, uh, liberal internationalism for the average person, everyday people, what is, it, what is it in for, what's in it for them? I think Biden feels very strongly about that. And that internationalism, if it doesn't have a, domestic payoff, then it is a kind of uh, precious uh, mentality that elites can have the luxury to ponder, but it's not really doing things for real people and real society. So bringing that back, and of course, uh, that's why the, the neoliberal move, uh, liberal internationalism looked like an a, a international platform for capitalists and bankers to do deals. It wasn't 
uh, elevating domestic society. So I guess, I guess I'm agreeing with you without necessarily giving you the specific recipe for for making that happen, but but I think that that's where a lot of the focus should be, and I think we've heard a little bit of that today earlier. Well, go ahead. Michelle. Yeah, I mean, I think actually, I mean, you said to put the university question aside, but well, uh, yeah. um, well, we've got four minutes left. You might. Well, I think the, <laughs> the first question and the university question is related because, I mean, when I first started teaching, and students were like, "I'm going to go join." Um, international human rights NGO and like save the world. And, you know, we used to have to say, have you thought about X or do you, have you thought about, you know, how the liberal, how liberalism looks from, you know, the global South or something we had to, you know, prompt them. And now, you know, students have kind of given up hope that anything <laughs> can be saved or, uh, and first it was, we can do nothing outside of the West, it's all like cultural imperialism. And now it's like, even the West is beyond hope. Um, so, I mean, that's why I really appreciate what John does because he's one of the few people I know who like really speaks up <laughs> for these principles. So some of that needs to be, if the order is to be salvaged, some of that needs to be restored. And I think one way of doing that is going back to what Mary said, you know, bringing the eco economics or rethinking the economics of it and maybe getting away from some of the you know, the identity stuff, but that's too, too big, of, <laughs> big of a conversation. Yeah. Charlie, and then we'll go to Mary to give Mary the last word. I'll speak to the to the question of, of uh, Ukraine and would it be a blow to the rules-based system if Putin ends up with a slice of the country? Yes, it would be. But uh, I would offer three caveats. Number one, I think this is already a strategic defeat for Russia. I don't think historians are going to look back at this war, see the Russians rebuffed from their effort to attack Kyiv, lose, I don't know, I'm hearing it, you know, 20,000 plus soldiers. I don't think this will be coded as a great example of a successful war, even if it ends with some Russian control of some piece of Ukraine. Secondly, I am not suggesting that, that, that what we should do here is just say here, you want it, you take it, but that we get a ceasefire and then you begin a diplomatic process that probably plays out over a long time about the status of these territories, including Crimea. Uh, and uh, do am I confident that if you do that one day they will go back to Ukraine? No, but it seems to me that that is a better solution than this, letting this go on for a very long time and running the risk of escalation and starvation in uh, countries that, that need the food. Uh, third point, Putin is going to be a troublemaker however this ends. Mm -hmm. It's in his DNA. And so people say, well, it, it, if we push him back to Russian territory, he'll never do this again. If he has a little chunk of, of Ukraine, he'll just keep doing. I don't, I think we're just gonna have to keep him in the box until he's dead. <laughs> That's who he is. So we better get used to it. Mary. <laughs> well, on that. I sort of agree with you. In good, this, good. But only sort of you, because you put I them don't in the, think... in the box after they're dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's that. So I don't think a diplomatic sol solution is a solution. I just think if there's a diplomatic agreement and it freezes the current territorial status quo, it's better than a long slog. But it doesn't stop things from happening again. It doesn't stop Putin from regrouping. Uh, it does, it is hugely unfair and unjust. Uh, and I think to judge by similar sorts of agreements that I've studied in other parts of the world, it won't change the sort of underlying societal problems. It'll make them worse. It'll contribute to fragmentation. That's really what the first agreement, the Minsk agreement did, it really weakened. I mean, it's amazing that Ukraine's done so much despite that agreement. Um, so I don't, so that's what I would say. I mean, I think that it's gonna go on, but it's just better than people dying. I mean, there are so hundreds of young men dying every 
day and it's just awful. So I wanted to say something about that. I wanted to say something about deglobalization. I think deglobalization may not be the right word. It may be just that we want a different kind of globalization. We are going to go on having, I mean, the internet and international communication. We are going to have to address climate change at a global level, and we're going to have to address pandemics at a global level. And actually, all these things are interconnected. We can't actually effectively address pandemics and effectively address climate change without also addressing wars, because wars are really terrible for the spread of disease and they're terrible for climate for environmental damage. So all those things are gonna happen, but it may be that we become a little bit more autarkic in mm. terms of trade, investment, technology, which to me wouldn't be a bad thing. It would probably contribute. I mean, we spend so much ridiculous amounts of money and fossil fuels trading when we could be producing them at home. So that's not a bad thing, but I think globalization is here to stay. And because we're coming to an end, I won't say all the other things I was going to say, except <laughs> to say, I do think there's a real concern about a food crisis and I really like your idea, but I'm not an expert. But the one thing I wanted to say was about universities. I just think universities are global institutions. They're the place where we meet you know, look at this right. audience, look at the people at LSE. Right. Uh, we, you know, I think the British at LSE are quite a small portion. <laughs> um, in fact, I'm the only one on this platform. Indeed, right. So. Uh, and I'm really European, I come from all over. But um, what I think is that you do gain these lifelong relationships uh, that really matter and that really make you feel it does matter what's happening in Ukraine and not only what's happening at home. It does matter what's happening in different parts of Africa and you get an identification with that. And I think that is hugely important because we're not going to solve any of the world's problems unless we have that sense of sort of global empathy. I think that is a terrific place to leave it. We have hit the bewitching hour. We're over it. Thank you for coming. It's great to have you all here. Please join me in thanking this terrific panel.